Today we're going to tackle a very beginner-friendly quilt. If you're on Instagram, you have probably seen all of the Ruby Star Society announcements of their perfect picnic quilt quilt along in summer 2022, which is right now. So today we are going to make the whole thing start to finish. So let's grab your fabric and let's get started. We are working from a pattern that I did not design. This is from Ruby Star Society directly. So the process for getting the pattern is going to be a little bit different, but there is a link to the pattern at the very top of the description of this video. You can also Google Ruby Star Society perfect picnic quilt and I'm sure that it will pop up. I missed out on the bundles for the fabric that I really wanted at the shop I was shopping at, so I ended up ordering a fat quarter bundle and then the yardage that I needed for the quilt. So I have a fat quarter bundle of this whole punch dot and then the larger cuts that are called for in the pattern. So I have my 10 fat quarters and then I have a light fabric, which is a yard and a quarter. I have a dark fabric, a yard and an eighth of that. And then I also bought some binding fabric, this cute black. So now I'm gonna break open this fat quarter bundle and choose the 10 that are gonna make it into the quilt. This is also a great pattern for pulling from your stash. You could pull any 10 fat quarters that you wanted to work together for your quilt and then just choose a corresponding light and a dark that um, you want to go with them. I've chosen my 10 fat quarters from the bundle and I chose all of the really bright, fun, poppy colors. So I removed all of the neutrals and some of the more muted colors. I also removed the blue and the white and the black that were already part of my larger fabric pull. So I'm gonna set these to the side and I'm sure I'll use them sometime. Pressing your fabrics is a really important step in the quilting process. Uh, getting rid of all of those lines that come in folded fabric, especially in these fat quarter bundles, is really important to improve your cutting accuracy. If you were to cut these fabrics without pressing them first, then all those little ridges and bumps would distort your measurements as you're cutting and just make it difficult to get really accurate pieces. And we're going to be cutting these fat quarters into five inch squares and we really need them to be five inches not four and three quarters or five and a quarter so we want these fabrics to be flat and stable and nice and ready for cutting so i'm going to go ahead and press all of my fabrics and even give them a little spritz with some best press or some spray starch to give them a little bit of stability and once I'm done with that, then I will go ahead and press the yardage that I received. And yardage is usually a little less folded and crisp and crinkled because it hasn't been packaged into a bundle, but it's still a good idea to give it a little press. If you do not have a really large cutting surface, then that is okay. You can always fold your fabric and make it a more manageable size. This cutting mat here in front of me is about 18 by 24 inches. So I'm gonna fold my fabric and cut it up. I'm going to start by folding my fabric so the selvage edges are lined up. This is the best kind of straight edge that we have. It's the woven edge of the fabric. So we're going to make sure that that fold is nice and straight, that these little fringes are right on top of each other. And then we can work from there. So looking at my cutting diagram, I need to cut this into four rows that are five inches wide. So the first thing I'm going to do is spin it around and give myself a nice clean edge start with. We've lined up those fringes, but now we need to cut the fringes off because we don't want those into our quilt. So I'm gonna grab my ruler and I am going to align one of the lines of my ruler. It doesn't really matter which. I'm gonna go with this two inch line with that fold on that fabric. And that's gonna give me a nice clean edge that runs parallel to this fringe. So now we need to spin it back around so we can work in our more normal cutting direction. Now I have a five inch wide ruler here, so I could just lay this down and align the edge of the ruler with the edge of the fabric and cut on the other side. But if you don't have a five inch wide ruler or a ruler that is wider than five inches, then you can just add your two rulers together. Uh, this is a three and a half inch ruler, so I need another inch and a half to get me up to five inches. So, I can put my three and a half inch ruler here and slide them so that the one and a half inch line on this ruler is aligned with that edge of the fabric. And now I can cut along the side of the ruler. One, two, three, four, five. 
it's a little trickier, but it will get you the same results in the end. So now I have a five inch wide strip and I'm gonna repeat that until we have four using up this whole fat quarter. So now I have four five by 18 inch strips and I need to cut them into five inch strips going the other way. So I'm just aligning my ruler with the edge of my fabric and I'm doing this first cut a little generously so that I can trim the other side of it to bring it down to a nice square five inches. Cause that initial cut, the factory cut of the your fat quarter edges is never quite perfect. So I'm now I can use use my cut to base my ruler off of and just work my way down the strip. You should get three five inch squares out of each of your four strips. So I spent some time cutting up the rest of my fat quarters and they're all done. And I have this really lovely pile of super colorful little five inch squares. And now it is time to cut up our yardage. We have our light yardage where we need to cut eight five inch by width of fabric strips. And that just means cutting from the selvage to the fold into five inch strips. And then we're gonna sub cut those strips into five inch squares so that they match up perfectly with those fat quarter squares that we've already cut. You're gonna be cutting quite a few of those, but it goes pretty quickly and you can really get into a groove of cutting five inch squares. <laughs> Once you are done with the light, then you need to cut the dark fabric in pretty much the same way, except instead of eight width of fabric strips, you only need seven. And in this case, I show you a little bit of an alternate cutting method where um, I can cut a little more quickly. I cut multiple layers by folding the length of the fabric over so that I'm cutting through four layers. And that just allows me to cut a little more quickly. And um, I'm comfortable with that. If you are new to cutting or you're working on improving your accuracy, then try cutting just one layer at a time. And that speed will come. Also, changing your rotary blade will certainly help. So now it is time to assemble our quilts. I have my fat quarter five inch squares, my dark and my light. This pattern has two different assembly methods. You can assemble these blocks into larger square units that are sewn together. And the instructions for that are on the first few pages of the assembly instructions. I'm going to go with the alternate assembly, which has you create rows and then sew the rows together in a top. It's just how I'm more comfortable working, but any method that works and makes sense for you is the method that you should choose. Just like with everything in quilting, um, it's more important that you are happy and you have a good outcome with the method that you are working. Don't let anybody tell you that you're doing something wrong if you're coming out with a block that looks how you want it to look. So let's start with row one, which is our A squares and C squares. So we need our light squares and our little print squares. Now my print squares, I stacked them up as I cut them. So they are all in kind of a repeating order. I have the yellow or the red, yellow, green, and that repeats you know, multiple times through this whole stack. So I'm gonna take a moment and just shuffle this up because it looks like I'm just gonna be drawing from this stack to sew to these white squares. So I don't want it to feel repetitive in the quilt. I want it to feel a little more scattered and random. So I'm just gonna shuffle these. So to piece row one, we're gonna take eight of our light squares and sew them to seven of our fat quarter squares, alternating just as it is in this picture so that we get that nice checkerboard effect. Now this pattern for both this assembly and the previous assembly, the block-based assembly, have really specific pressing instructions. You are free to follow them or you can press in a way that makes sense to you. I usually press all of my seams open, but since this is a checkerboard style quilt, a patchwork quilt, there's gonna be a really great opportunity for nesting seams here. And um, there won't be that much additional bulk as opposed to pressing all of our seams open. So I'm gonna go ahead and press just as it is in this assembly instruction. If you look at the instructions for this first row, it has alternating A and C squares all the way across. And if you break it down, there are seven AC pairs across with one extra A all the way over there at the right end. Now, this means that this is a prime candidate for chain piecing. We can sew seven 
A to 7C without having to pause in between. We can put them through the machine right after the other, press them, and then join them back together. And then at the very end, we can add that A on to complete our row. When I am chain piecing, I like to use a quarter inch guide on my machine. Um, I use this almost all the time, and I like this particular one. I get a ton of questions about it, and it is the Juki Adjustable Seam Guide, and it screws into some holes that are in my machine. So this one may not work for you, but if it doesn't, there are magnetic ones that work on almost any machine, or there may be one from your machine's manufacturer that fits. I like this one because it swings out of the way to give me a little extra room in here if I am doing like a half square triangle and I need a little room to the right. And then it just snaps back in and I'm good to go chain piecing. Now I am gonna make sure with this white on white fabric that I am sewing the right sides together. Although with this fabric, I don't think anyone would ever know if I sewed a piece upside down. So I'm just aligning the two edges so they are nice and square to each other. And then I have a knee lift on my machine so I can lift the presser foot. If you don't, you can lift it back here or just nudge it under there so that it meets where the needle is. So I have my chain of seven pairs all done. Each pair is a fat quarter and a light square. So now I'm gonna cut them apart. I have this nifty little chain piecing cutter, but you could also use scissors or the little side blade on your machine is really handy. But uh, we just need to cut those couple of stitches holding them all together. And now you have a choice to make. You can go ahead and press these seams or you can wait until the whole row is complete. Uh, we won't need to sew across these seams until we are assembling our quilt top. So you can wait until the whole row is done to press all in one direction. And I think that's what I'm gonna do. So I am going to just unfold these and stack them up. And I'm gonna make sure I'm stacking them all with the light square on the left because we started with a light square on our row assembly guide. Now, if you want to lay these out and pick exactly what order these colors are coming in, then you certainly can, but I'm letting this just fall to chance. We have our seven pairs and then we need one extra white for the very end. So I'm gonna just set that aside. And now we need to sew all of these together. And I'm gonna do the same chain piecing that I did before. I'm gonna take one pair and I am going to flip the next one right sides together. And if you wanna take a moment to open it up and make sure it's light, fat quarter, light, fat quarter, then uh, take that moment. So I'm gonna sew these into a couple of pairs and then we'll come back. So now we are down to three sets of four squares. And then we have this little leftover. We had one uh, pair of light and fat quarter and that last a square. Now we could go ahead and sew these together and just make sure this guy is always on the end so that a square ends up all the way on the right side or we could wait and sew this on at the very end and mix this guy in wherever we wanted. I'm going to save this for the end just to make it a little bit easier on myself so I don't have to think too hard about um, direction or where these go. Now all we need to do is sew our large four square chunks together, making sure that we are keeping that alternating fat quarter and light square um, sequence as we sew. So I am going to sew this seam and then I'm gonna sew our little two-piecer here to one of the other four square pieces. And that will get our row into two large chunks with this one leftover square for the end. Just two more seams to go. We have a really long piece, an almost as long piece, and I'm gonna sew these right sides together so that our light and our fat quarter piece are meeting. You could just as equally do it this way if you wanted this color sequence. I'm going for totally random, so I'm just gonna sew them together without too much thought. 
Our row is just about complete. If we look back at the diagram, it is supposed to begin and end with a light square. And we have begun with a light square, but we're ending with a colored square, a, a, a fat quarter square. So I'm gonna sew my last little five inch square, making sure I have the right side. And this fabric is really difficult to tell. So I'm not gonna worry too much about it since it's hard to tell from two inches away looking really hard. So someone looking at this quilt once it's finished will probably never notice. So all the seams in my row are now complete and you could go ahead and make all of your rows and then press them or press each row as you finish it, whichever method or sequence you prefer. I like to take a break after some piecing and do a little pressing. So I will probably press my rows as I complete them. And then I like to hang up my rows on my bookshelf so I can kind of see how it's coming together. For our quilt, we will need a total of eight rows that look just like this. And the colors can obviously move around and change as you see fit. The only other row that we need to make for this quilt is the row number two, which is going to feel very similar. It is going to have that same alternating square sequence that we had in our row one, except it's going to be flipped just a little bit. Where the light squares were in row one, we will have our fat quarter squares. And where our fat quarter squares were in row one, we will have our dark squares. So we're going to begin and end with a fat quarter and every other square will be our darks. So I'm going to show you an alternate assembly method if you didn't like all the pairing and then sewing together larger segments that we did in row one. You can also assemble the row as a large single unit. And we are going to start with our first square that is the one that is all the way to the left, this first C square. And that is a fat quarter square. And then we're going to put a dark square right on top of it and sew them together. And after every seam, we are gonna open this up and add to the right. So I just sewed a dark square. I'm gonna grab a fat quarter square and add it. So we are growing our row from the left all the way over to the right. And you're just gonna alternate your two piles here until you have all of your squares. You should have 15 squares by the end of it. So that completes my row two with all that lovely dark blue fabric. And now I just need to complete the rest of the rows of the quilt. And they are exactly the same as the ones I've already sewn. So you can pick the row assembly method that you like better, either pairing and then repairing to make bigger chunks or this one at a time build a row method. They both result in the same row. So pick which one one makes sense to you and you feel good about. In the end, you need to have eight row ones, and those are the rows with the light fabric, and seven row twos. Those are the ones with the dark fabric. And once we have all of those done and pressed, then we will assemble our quilt top in the next step. So you have a couple of options when it comes to actually sewing your rows together to form your quilt top. You can sew your rows together into pairs like this, and then sew the pairs into pairs so that you have a group of four and then sew those together so that you have one left center seam at the very end. Or what you can do is sew row one to row two and then add row three and then add row four. So that is growing in one direction. That's just how we assembled the rows, the two options, and it's completely up to you. I like to sew my rows together into pairs so that I can keep clipping them up and arranging them as desired. So to do that and to start the other method, you have to grab two rows to start. So here's my row one, row one, and my row two, which is right underneath it. Now your fat quarter squares should be alternating and your light and dark fabric should be alternating. So if you have a fat quarter square being sewn to a fat quarter square as you line them up, then you need to make sure that your rows were assembled correctly since we're going for this kind of checkerboard plaid look. I pressed all of my seam allowances to the sides. And when I was arranging my rows, I made sure that they were going in opposite directions. So this row was pressed with all of the seam allowances towards this way. So they're towards the light square here. And this row was pressed the other way. So all the seam allowances were pressed this way. 
And what that does is when we put these two rows right sides together to sew them, those seam allowances are going to nest really nicely. They're gonna kind of lock into place. So if you put them together and you kind of wiggle them back and forth, you will feel them almost snap together like a set of snaps. And that just allows you to sew them either without using pins or it gives you a really great place to pin them. And it's going to ensure that your seams all meet up, all your little squares line up and you get a really nice intersection there. So it looks like this rather than like this, where they're just off a little bit. There's nothing wrong with this. Your quilt will still be totally functional. If you have a couple of seams that are a little off, don't worry about it unless it bothers you. You can always rip out a quilt and fix something, but try not to stress too much about it because in the end, this quilt is going to be used, it's going to be washed, it's going to shrink a little bit in that washing process, and all of those tiny mistakes will become much less obvious when the quilt is all finished. So try the little snapping technique or pinning if you are more comfortable with that, and we are gonna sew this row together. But um, again, if it doesn't come out perfect, that's okay. I'm going to sew this together without pins. So I am going to align this first square and my first intersection, and I'm just gonna pinch them while I get to my sewing machine. So I have aligned this corner, and I'm gonna take a couple of stitches. And then I'm gonna make sure that this intersection is nice and snapped together. I'm just gonna wiggle my finger here, make sure that these edges are aligned and that intersection is nice and stable. I'm gonna keep my finger right here as I move this seam under the needle. As soon as I get past that line of stitching, then I'm gonna repeat that process. I'm gonna pick up my two rows. I'm gonna make sure that my seam allowances are going in different directions. And I'm just going to wiggle them until they snap together. And then I'm gonna sew until I pass this seam. Now, as always, this is just my method. If you would prefer to pin this whole seam, then you certainly can. So those are our two rows all sewn together. And you can wait and press everything at the very end, but I find it a little more manageable to press these smaller segments as I go. So I'm gonna give this a press and then we can hang it back up on my bookshelves over there and grab two more rows, sew them together. Once you have all of your rows sewn into pairs like this, then we can sew our pairs together and it works exactly the same way. We are going to just put them right sides together and we are gonna use those interlocking seams to sew these larger segments together. So that is our four rows together. Now I'm going to repeat that process, making my segments of my quilt top bigger and bigger until I have that one final seam that usually goes somewhere around the middle of a quilt. And let's meet back when I am done with that. So with my final seam complete, my top is done and it looks fantastic. Now it's not quite a quilt yet. Um, we still need to quilt it with uh, batting and backing as well as bind it. And there are so many options to accomplish both of those things that I'm not gonna cover them in this video, but I will link my playlist of free motion quilting for absolute beginners. Um, it'll tell you how to set up your machine, how to actually do free motion quilting and all the things that you'll need. And as far as binding, there are several videos out there on how to hand bind or machine bind, whichever is your preference. And um, you can go with either option and both will get you that finished quilt. So that's it for the perfect picnic quilt. And it ended up taking me about four and a half to five hours to go from fabric to finished quilt top. Um, your mileage may vary if you um, cut fewer layers or if you sew at a different pace than I do, but it should give you a rough estimate of the workload that you are getting into. 
I will see you again in a couple of weeks with another video. Until then, happy quilting!